Today's psalm is a pretty dramatic scene, and I wonder if you can picture this. God walks into a courtroom full of hostile plaintiffs and angry spectators. God strolls into a corporate boardroom full of greedy vice presidents. God interrupts a congressional session as God strides down the center aisle and shocks us all by coming into this building this morning. God takes over the podium, takes a seat in the largest, most comfy leather chair, takes our full attention. He grabs the gavel in hand, and, he, as, and as he begins to speak, everyone falls silent. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the weak and the, to the wicked? How long will you consider prophets over people? How long will we ignore those hurting in our communities and bury our heads in the sand as we keep on doing what we've always done? How long will we take advantage of the weak, the poor, and those in need? It's strange for me to picture God in a divine council, the central figure in a meeting of all the other gods and power players as this psalm describes it. It's hard for me to imagine God in the boardrooms that I used to frequent during my time working in corporate business. It's hard for me to picture God in Congress and in courtrooms and even in the country club where today's rich and powerful gather to discuss things. Is God still present with us today? Or are we perhaps simply unwilling or unable to hear God's words to us on power and money. Billy Graham once said, give me five minutes with a person's checkbook and I will tell you where their heart is. And he said, if a person gets his attitude towards money straight, then it will help straighten out almost every other area in their lives. So today we're going to begin straightening things out a bit and talking about economics, how our organization of wealth and power affects our ability to be or to become Christians. This is the fourth in a six-part series taken from the United Methodist Church's Social Principles, a small book which I know some of you are reading along with us as we go. If you're just tuning in, you've missed a few sermons on the natural environment, our social community, the nurturing community, and the way we socially organize our world. Next week, we'll tackle politics. And after that, world peace. But... <laughs> Let's not bite off more than we can chew. The Bible says this week's section has plenty of worry for one day of its own. This section, from affirming private ownership of property as trusteeship under God, to supporting all public and private employees and employers in their right to collective bargaining and the formation of unions, is full of statements on our economic systems. It denounces poverty especially poverty caused by natural disasters, which we know a lot about in this town in the past few years. It denounces poverty caused by war and calls for us to bring more peace into the world. And it even denounces poverty caused by your geolocation, the fact that those in the southern hemisphere of this world live far, far more often in poverty than those of us in the northern hemisphere. This section of the social, social Principles affirms foreign workers and their right to seek a better life in a new country. And it expands the definition of corporate responsibility to include the earth as one of the most important stakeholders. It encourages godly consumption, buying fair trade, supporting family farms, and reducing public indebtedness. It speaks out strongly against graft and corruption, gambling, and unjust financial institutions. And it urges global interdependence through international trade and investment. Above all, it affirms a theological right to work and leisure, which echoes sentiments we find in our country's own Constitution and Bill of Rights. The social principles do not speak specifically about economic systems, capitalism, socialism, or other plans. But as I read the core values in this section and its condemnations, I asked myself, can I be both Christian and capitalist? It's an interesting question. And I found that the answer for me is yes, but. 
Yes. Yes to the claim that all economic systems are, quote, under the judgment of God, no less than other facets of the created order. Yes to the, quote, holding private and public economic enterprises responsible for social costs of doing business, such as employment and environmental pollution. And yes to, quote, supporting measures that would reduce the concentration of wealth in the hands of a few. But, there's always a but, isn't there? <laughs> But this section of the principles fails to quote the Bible even once, and it barely mentions theological or religious issues surrounding these important economic issues. And as I preached a few weeks ago, I began to worry as we stray too far from our expertise in the Bible and in theology and in following the message of Jesus Christ. I start to worry until I get to section E in this book. It's called Poverty. And then I'm whipped right back into today's scripture from Psalm 82 and to Jesus' own words. Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. American capitalism rarely delivers anyone. And it usually only delivers the needy as stepping stones to the wealthy for them to amass more wealth and power. But I ask myself, is it unholy to be rich? Or is it more holy to be poor? And that is not a new question. People in Jesus' day often asked him the very same thing. And his answer reminds me of a quote I read by Mother Teresa this week. We have no right to judge the rich. What we desire is not a class struggle, but a class encounter in which the rich save the poor. And the poor save the rich. Mother Teresa's example of choosing a life of extreme poverty in the ghettos of India still resonate, resonates today, 18 years after her death. I also read a story this week about her visit to Australia. A new recruit to the monastery there was assigned to be her guide and her gopher. The young man was thrilled at the prospect of being so close to this godly woman and he dreamed of how much he would learn from her and what they would talk about. But during her visit, he became frustrated. Although he was constantly near her, he was never able to say one word to Mother Teresa. There were always other people around for her to meet and take her attention. Finally, her tour was over, and she was due to fly to New Guinea. And in desperation, the friar seized an opportunity to speak to her and said, if I pay my own fare to New Guinea, can I sit next to you on the plane and talk to you and learn from you? Mother Teresa looked at him. You have enough money to pay your airfare to New Guinea? And he excitedly replied, oh, yes. And she said, then give that money to the poor. You'll learn more from doing that than anything I could tell you. The young man wanted to experience a feeling rather than simply to learn by doing. So this morning, rather than get caught up in debating the ins and outs of economic theory or systems or the best way to end global poverty, I'd like for us to take a moment to consider our own attitudes towards giving. Martin Luther, the unintended founder of the Protestant religions, once said people go through three conversions their head, their heart, and their pocketbook. Unfortunately, they don't all happen at the same time. I have no idea where you are on your spiritual journey today. If your intellect or your head has been convinced or converted to Christianity, if you have ever experienced a warming of the heart that John Wesley described in his first personal encounter with the Holy Spirit, which was years into his public pastoral ministry, or if you perhaps have ever prayed or witnessed to your faith by using your checkbook or your pocketbook. No matter where you are or where you've been, I invite us all to consider taking a next step this morning. When John Wesley visited his congregations, he would question their progress in the faith by asking if their Christianity had affected their pockets. And I like that question. How are your pockets today? How's your checkbook how is your spiritual journey affecting your monthly budget? Until we can answer those questions in some type of meaningful way,
then we are all like that young monk wanting to experience a feeling of faith or talk about changing the world rather than getting out in the world and changing it by simply changing ourselves and our actions and our giving. Psalm 82 reminds me that we are all children of the Most High. So I marvel when we live our lives as if we believe that God does not have a plan for us, as if we don't trust God to prosper us and to give us hope and a future, as Jeremiah 29, 11 encourages. I'm shocked that some of us would rather hole up with, alone with our spreadsheets and our financial programs, our budgets and our plans, rather than get down on our knees and give up our control of our finances to God, trusting that the more we give, the more we will receive and be taken care of. The principles in this section say, such wanton carelessness cannot continue. And wise stewardship is needed today to provide for future generations. Call me naive, but I do believe that one person truly can make a difference and that our ec economic choices today do impact our families and our children and future generations here and across the globe. The Dalai Lama was right when he said, if you think you are too small to make a difference, then try sleeping with a mosquito. <laughs> we spent Friday night camping at Estes and there were a few of those little bugs in our tent and I can tell you that one small creature can make a huge difference. And so I pray this morning that this sermon and this topic may be a mosquito in your life and that you may be stung with generosity and with gratitude and with trust and risk to trust God more. I believe that we can commit ourselves to being both capitalist and Christian, but only if we continue to grow in Christian love in our lives, in our heads and our hearts, and especially in our choices. I'd invite you now to take your bulletin in hand and recite aloud together part four of the United Methodist Church's Social Creed, which deals with this section on economic community. Let us speak. We believe in the right and duty of persons to work for the glory of God and the good of themselves and others and in the protection of their welfare in doing so in the right to property as a trust from God, collective bargaining, and responsible consumption, and in the elimination of economic and social distress. May the Lord take these beliefs and move them from our heads into our hearts and convert them into action. Amen. Amen.